Welcome everyone to the biannual ballot measure explainer. I'm Kim Nalder, professor at Sacramento State and director of the project for an informed electorate at Sacramento State. And we have put on this event for several election cycles uh, with, in partnership with the Sacramento Public Library and with the assistance of the Le Legislative Analyst's Office. So we're very thankful to have the Legislative Analyst's Office here to give us their expertise on the ballot measures. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce Rivka Sass, the director of the Sacramento Public Library. Thank you, Kim. I'm very happy to be here and uh, to join all of you. And I wanna just give a shout out to Professor Nalder for, for continuing to do this uh, in partnership with the Sacramento Public Library and the Legislative Analyst's Office. Uh, we're so happy. I think we've been doing this now for about eight years, yeah. at least. And uh, that's a lot of elections. I want to remind everyone that uh, 26 of our 20 li 28 libraries are ballot drop-off sites. We also have 11 libraries that will be vote centers open from uh, the 31st of October through, the, through election day. So please, Get your ballots in early. I worked one of the sites on Saturday. We had about 60 ballots dropped off in a two hour period. Take advantage of your local library. Do some pickup, pick up your books, uh, get some uh, personal shopping done by your favorite librarian and let us, let us help with the voting process. We also have a telephone number that you can call. It's 916-331-VOTE and leave us a message and we will get back to you with Thank more you. information about voting. So I don't know what you missed, but um, we have a telephone number 916-331-VOTE. Please use that if you need additional information uh, beyond what's in your uh, voter guide. And remember that you can vote safely and securely. You can drop your uh, ballots off at almost every Sacramento Public Library. We still have two that are closed, one for construction and one uh, that we're getting ready to deal with thanks to COVID-19. It's got some challenges. So welcome and thank you. And thanks to the friends of Sacramento Public Library who are volunteering at just about every location, helping us make sure that uh, the ballots are delivered safely and securely. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Nalder. And we can't wait to hear what everyone has to say. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to plug one more thing, which is we have a project for an informed electorate event coming up on October 28th. It's a, an, uh, an election preview. We've got some experts talking about all sorts of things to try to make sense of the election, talking about appeals to Latinx voters, political misinformation, presidential rhetoric, uh, religious appeals, what's up with the polls, and then any other questions that people have. So it's a similar sort of thing. You sign up and show up on Zoom. So we'd love to have you on October 28th. And then some housekeeping before we begin this event. So it is being recorded. We are going to post videos of the entire event, but also individual videos of the initiatives, each initiative one by one on the website for the Project for an Informed Electorate. Um, you can look at captions if you click co closed caption at the bottom. And if you have any issues, go to chat. You can talk to the producer. And if you have any questions, which you know you very well may, um, put those in the Q&A. So we'll go initiative by initiative. And as we're doing that, if questions come up for you, once we're done explaining that initiative, we'll take questions. So don't, don't waste any time in getting those questions in. All right, so first off, we have Jason, Jason Constanoros, who's going to explain the role of the Legislative Analyst Office, and then he'll start with Prop 14. Great. Well, it's good to be here tonight. Thank you. So we thought we'd, uh, before we get into the measures, just explain uh, who we are and our role in uh, the ballot process. Um, so in terms of who we are, um, the Legislative Analyst and the office he oversees, the Legislative Analyst Office, is the California Legislature's nonpartisan budget and policy advisor. Um, and what we mean by nonpartisan is that we serve all members of the legislature 
uh, Democrat and Republican, and also both houses of the legislature, the Assembly and the Senate. And our office consists of around 50 staff covering all aspects of the state budget. Uh, these issues range from things like tax revenues in the economy to education and criminal justice, health and human services, and the environment. And then our office has been around since the 1940s, but our role in analyzing ballot measures uh, really begins in, in 1974 when voters authorized Proposition 9. And Proposition 9 tasked us uh, with a couple of different activities, but most relevant for tonight is that we are tasked with providing a brief description and background, explaining each measure, and then also for each measure, explaining the fiscal impact uh, that the measure might have on state and local governments. And one thing I, we want to reiterate for you tonight as you're thinking about your questions is that we do not take positions for or against ballot measures. Our role is to provide information and to uh, analyze fiscal impacts, but not to weigh in on the merits of the proposal. Wonderful. Um, if you could start then with Proposition 14. Absolutely. So Proposition 14 would authorize the state to sell five and a half billion dollars in bonds to support an existing state program that funds stem cell research. The state program in question was established by voters uh, back in 2004 under Proposition 71, and that measure authorized $3 billion in bonds to fund the program, and those funds have largely been spent. So this measure would enable the uh, program to uh, continue its activities. The way the program works is the state sells bonds to investors, and then the proceeds of those sales are available to an agency called the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. That agency in turn provides grants to researchers in the state, researchers both at uh, universities and also researchers at companies in private industry. And those researchers are the folks who are conducting uh, stem cell research, and they're also uh, engaged in a variety of activities to try to develop new uh, cures and treatments for a variety of different diseases. When the state sells the bonds, it then uh, repays those bonds over many years with interest. Now the measure in addition to authorizing the bonds has several provisions that uh, dictate how the funds are to be spent and then also um, make a variety of changes to um, CIRM's governance uh, and a couple of other related issues. We don't have time to get into all of those uh, issues tonight. Uh, we, we do mention some of them in our, uh, the uh, voter guide. But one thing um, that is very notable is that um, of the five and a half billion, about one and a half billion would be specifically designated for diseases related to uh, the brain and nervous system. So things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Now in terms of the fiscal impact on the state, the primary fiscal impact would be the cost to the state to repay the bonds. And we estimate that cost would average around $260 million each year uh, for about 30 years. One thing to keep in mind with this fiscal impact is that under the measure, for the first five years were the measure to, after the measure were it to pass, um, the bond proceeds would, would, would be paying that, um, would be making those payments. And then after, uh, it, starting in year six, the state would uh, make those payments. So the fiscal impact on the state would be delayed for a few years after it were the measure to be enacted. Now, our analysis in the voter guide does note other fiscal impacts um, that could result from the measure. These impacts include um, income generated from new treatments that are developed that could be available to help offset the cost of those treatments. Um, they also could include sort of downstream effects on the state's economy or healthcare system uh, were new treatments to be developed. Um, but these fiscal impacts were, are fairly uncertain and uh, we aren't able to uh, further quantify or, or provide more um, specific uh, estimates of those impacts. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm happy to move on to Q&A. Hold on. <laughs> So first, we'll, we'll go through some more content about this measure, and then we'll do Q&A after that. Okay, so first question people sometimes have is, how did this get on the ballot? Um, it was funded or put on the ballot by um, Robert Klein II, a housing developer. He was also behind Prop 71, the one that um, 
initiated this, this entire um, framework. And um, again, the, the funding from that initiative is running out. And so it's an attempt to re-up that. Uh, I wanted to go through some endorsements as well. So the C California Democratic Party is in favor of it, the Republican Party and all of the other minor parties that are uh, weighing in are in opposition. Um, in support, we have the Bay Area Council, Equality California, Housing California, the UC Regents and the governor. And then against we have the, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, California nurses, so taxpayer groups and the nurses. Newspapers, no, no newspapers endorsed it, but se several did oppose it. So a number of the, the major newspapers across the state uh, weighed in against this one. The funding is really lopsided. Um, so we have Robert Klein, the one who put it on the ballot in the first place. Um, Dagmar Dolby, who's actually from the, the Dolby sound system, um, Dolby's, and several other um, groups there that funded it. And you can see that this is incredibly lopsided. So we have uh, you know, almost $10 million in favor of Prop 14 and a big 250 or slightly more than that really. Um, so some of these numbers, um, it, it depends on when the snapshot was taken. So these get updated over time. This won't be the final amount, but we're giving you some kind of a guideline as to where the money's coming from and where you're gonna see ads, right? So if there's you know, $10 million in favor and almost nothing against, you'll see ads only in favor. Okay, what questions do you have? Questions on stem cell. Okay, so one of the questions that, that I was wondering is, it looks like the, the money that Prop 71 said that would be generated back to the state from the, you know, use, using, developing new technologies and so far, forth would be, you know, large, but how much has that actually generated, do we know? Right, so just for, just for folks at home, um, props, under Prop 71, uh, to the extent that new um, treatments or inventions or cures are developed as a result of the funds, uh, a portion of the income generated from that is required to go back to the state. Um, and under Prop 71, that was available to the state as general income, available for general expenditures. Um, under uh, um, Prop 14, there would be a similar requirement, but any income generated under Prop 14 would be designated specifically to help offset um, the costs of uh, new treatments and cures. Um, I don't have the, the exact number in front of me um, on Prop 71, but generally the income that was generated from that um, range in um, a, a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, and for context, the state uh, general fund budget is in the low hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay. Uh, there's a question. There's a question about if we know if the nurses association, why the nurses association is opposed to it. And I, I don't know the answer to that one. I know the answers to many of them, but that is not one of them, I'm afraid. Um, Jason, do you have any ideas? No. Okay. All right. We are going to move on in the interest of time to the next measure. Thank you, Jason. The next measure is Proposition 15, and Brian Euler will be presenting that one. Okay. Uh, Proposition 15 uh, would make two major changes to the taxation of business properties in California. Uh, the first and the biggest change would be that would be made by Prop 15 is to modify the way that counties determine the taxable value of commercial properties. The end result of this change would be that most owners of commercial properties worth more than $3 million would pay higher property taxes. Uh, this change would be put in place over time, uh, starting in 2022, uh, but probably would not be fully in place until around 2025. Uh, the second change that we made by Prop 15 is to reduce the amount of property taxes business pay for their non-real estate property, such as equipment, machinery, and furniture. Specifically, each business's property tax bill for their business equipment would be reduced by around $5,500 per year. 
Uh, and if a business's current tax bill on their equipment is less than that amount, its bill would be uh, eliminated entirely. Neither of these changes would affect the amount of property taxes paid on residential properties. Uh, while Prop 15 does increase taxes on some business properties uh, and reduces it on others, overall it will result on an increased property tax payments by owners of business properties. Uh, our office estimates that Prop 15, once it has been fully implemented in around 2025, will result in between 6.5 billion to 11.5 billion per year in new property taxes that would go to local governments and schools. About 60% would go to cities, counties, and special districts across the state, while the remaining 40% would go to schools and community colleges. Okay, um, so this measure is essentially, if you, you probably everyone knows Prop 13, even if you weren't around in 1978 when it passed. Um, it's the property tax initiative that's had a huge impact on the state since then. So this is called the split roll, which is splitting off the the property taxes from um, individual homes and the business property taxes. And so allowing the business property taxes to um, shift with the market and but keeping the Prop 13 protections for homes. So who put it on the ballot is something people often ask. Um, it's the League of Women Voters head at the time and then um, people who head up other um, sort of uh, community engagement and activist organizations. It's something that's been talked about for many years uh, and as a way of, of changing some of the effects of Prop 13. So we have the Democratic Party and the Green Party and the Peace and Freedom Party in support. The Republican Party and Libertarian Party are against. And then we have a whole group of organizations in support, including uh, the Sierra Club, the League of Women Voters, the ACLU, um, the Nurses Association, again, um, Dolores Huerta as an individual is in favor of it. Teachers, nurses, et cetera. And then in opposition, we have um, business organizations, of course, and taxpayers organizations. Um, an, an interesting thing about the NAACP thing that you'll see come up a lot, um, sometimes in a place that you wouldn't expect to see the NAACP, um, the, the head of that organization, the statewide organization, is Alice Huffman. And she, in addition to being the head of the statewide NAACP, has a consulting firm. And many of these um, ballot measure committees have paid money to her consulting firm. So take that as you may. Uh, on the endorsements for the media, we have the San Francisco Chronicle, LA Times, and La Opinion on support. And then opposition, we have a, a number of other newspapers across the state, Northern and Southern California, including the Mercury News. And then the funding here, we have on the yes side, Chan Zuckerberg, that's the Zuckerberg you think it is, Teachers Association, unions especially. And then we have business organizations on the no side, unsurprisingly, because they would pay additional taxes. And this one's neck and neck. You've actually got really close funding and that's, that's pretty unusual. That means you'll end up seeing um, ads for both sides on this one, which isn't the case with, with some of these. Okay, some questions. Is farmland considered commercial industrial property under this initiative? No. Wow, that was, that was succinct, thank you. Um, who's overseeing the funding allocation? <clears throat> Counties are uh, constitutionally charged with allocating property tax revenues and that they would also be in charge of uh, allocating these dollars as well. Could this potentially increase rents and expenses for small businesses? I think the measure could have a variety of effects on costs for small businesses. I think some small businesses could see uh, some increased costs from taxes or rent. Some, it could be neutral. Some could uh, achieve uh, either tax or other savings uh, under the measure. I think it, it's, not, it's not possible to, to make kind of a, a generalized statement. There is a provision in there where um, smaller businesses can deduct some of their uh, other costs, right? Some of their business furniture and so forth or their equipment. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, it, uh, the measure reduces essentially the taxable value of, of business uh, equipment and machinery and, and furniture, basically all of the property owned by businesses that isn't land and buildings. Um, and, uh, you know, this exception, this uh, change would result in a reduction of their tax bill for those kinds of items by up to $5,500 a year per business. And how is the $3 million value determined? Um, I, I'm not sure I know what, what that question means, but it's, I think... Um, although, yeah, so is it all of the property that they own or other things that add up to that $3 million? Yeah, so the, the $3 million threshold is applied uh, to the property owner. Um, so uh, if I owned... Uh, $2 million, if I owned uh, three properties that total $2 million, um, none of them would be uh, uh, included in this. If I owned three properties that totaled $4 million, even if none of them were more, were individually worth $3 million or more, they would be uh, subject to the changes under this measure. Okay, so if, if, if an individual owned less $3 million or less than $3 million in, in business property, they would still be under the current Prop 13 limits. That's right. Okay, thank you. And then we have some questions about if it would um, lead to changing the other half of Prop 13. Not necessarily. Um, you know, people always make slippery slope arguments, but it would be a separate um, measure entirely to do that. And it's very popular. If you look at public opinion polls over the years, Prop 13 is incredibly po popular for, for uh, homeowners, obviously, or potential future homeowners too. Okay, thank you, Brian. We're going to move on to the next measure, which is Prop 16. We have Lourdes Morales presenting this one. Good evening. Um, to understand Prop 16, you have to go back to 1996 when voters approved Proposition 209, which established a new section in the Constitution which generally banned the consideration of five characteristics, race, sex, color, ethnicity, and national origin from public, empo public employment, public contracting, and public education. Uh, so there are a couple of exceptions to Prop 209, which means these characteristics can be used today. One of the key ones is that they can be used if it's a requirement of receiving federal funding. One area where this often comes in is in uh, federal transportation funding, where some projects require there to be a consideration on whether businesses are owned by women or people of color when you're contracting out uh, federally funded transportation projects. Uh, but generally, before Prop 209, these five characteristics could be used. So, for example, race and ethnicity could be used as one of several uh, characteristics considered in admissions for public uh, universities and colleges. Uh, but after Prop 209, uh, these programs either needed to be uh, canceled completely or modified in some way. So for example, rather than considering race or sex um, or, or ethnicity, excuse me, a program may consider uh, whether you are the first in your family to go to college. So this is a way where you are not considering one of the characteristics that was banned by 209. Um, but if your goal is still to um, target certain populations, you could use these other characteristics. What Proposition 16 does is uh, repeal Prop 209, essentially, which would allow state and local entities to consider the five characteristics, race, sex, color, ethnicity, and national origin in public education, public contracting, and public employment. Um, but the proposal still requires that these uh, considerations still comply with state and federal law. So most notably, the federal constitution has equal protections uh, that generally consider similarly situated people to be treated in similar ways under the law. As for the fiscal effects of these measures, there is no direct fiscal effect uh, because it would require uh, specific actions down the road for state and local entities to adopt their policies to uh, consider these characteristics. So the uh, fiscal effects are, are unknown and will depend on those future actions. Thank you. So essentially we would revert to pre-209. That's correct. So you could consider uh, those, the five characteristics as was the case before 1996. Okay. So putting this on the ballot, um, the legislature put this on the ballot. It was mostly a party line vote with the Democrats in favor of it. Um, 
it, they do need a super majority to, to do this and, and they reach that threshold. And it's again, a repeal of Prop 209. In support, we have the Democratic Party, Green Party, Peace and Freedom. And in opposition, the Republicans and Libertarians. And then on support, we have the ACLU, League of Women Voters, um, Courage California, Equality California, the Sierra Club. Um, I, I couldn't list them all, but almost the entire California congressional delegation and many other um, Democratic statewide officials, including the governor. And then also Pete Buttigieg weighed in for some reason in support of it. And then against, we have um, the Chinese American Civic Act Action Alliance, Ward Connerly, who was behind Prop 209 back in the day, and then um, a couple of state senators. Uh, for the press, we have support from the LA Times, the Mercury News, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, among others. And then against, we have the Orange County Register, San Bernardino Sun, and the Press Enterprise. And then the funding on this, we have, as you can see, it's really lopsided, right? We have uh, money from the California Teachers Association, the Kaiser, ECLU, so some organizations that you recognize in addition to some individuals. And then against, um, we just have you know, a few individuals with small um, donations and a, a group called Students for Fair Admission, Admissions that's small too. So you can see that there's you know, over 18 million, almost 19 million in favor and just a little over 1 million against. So again, you'll see more ads for, for it than you'll see against it. All right, what questions do you have on Prop 16? Let's see. So this will renew affirmative action, right? So affirmative action isn't a sort of defined term, but it would allow for the consideration of the five characteristics noted in the measure. So essentially, yes, but not with, um, with quotas. Quotas are not allowed. Right, so there, any uh, policy uh, that a state or local government would put in place would have to comply with existing federal laws. And so there's been a lot of case law in this area. One is around quotas not being prohibited. Okay. Other questions on this measure? I'm not seeing a whole lot. Okay. Um, oh wait, the Sacramento State take a stand on this? Not officially, no and I would not want to speak for the university. Uh, uh, has there been any analysis on the economic benefit for people in those five groups? We haven't published any work uh, related to the effects from, from 209. Okay, so we don't know for sure. We do know that enrollments decreased in those groups uh, at the UCs, for example. So there were some impacts when 209 um, took place. Okay, well, th thank you so much, and we're going to move on to the next measure. All right, the next measure is Proposition 17, and we have Luke Kushmaro presenting. Thank you. So, to provide a little background before we get into what this proposition does, the state constitution allows most U.S. citizens who are residents of California and at least 18 years of age to vote so long as they register to vote. This includes people who are currently in county jail or supervised by county probation departments in the community. However, the state constitution prevents some people from registering to vote, including those who are in state prison and those who are on state parole. In California, state parole is a period of time that some individuals coming out of prison serve um, after serving a prison term for a serious or violent offense. Currently, there are roughly 50,000 people on state parole. Proposition 17 would change the state constitution to allow people on state parole to register to vote and thereby allow them to vote. Um, this would have some increases in workload, both at the county level and also at the state level. At the county level, there would be increased workload due to there being additional individuals who register to vote, creating increased work for county election officials who manage lists of registered voters and validate that all those voters registered in that county are eligible to vote. And it would also create workload for the county election officials because there would be increased ballots that would need to be mailed out and other ballot materials. At the state level, there'd be increased one times, and at the county level, these increased costs would probably be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
at the state level, there'll be increased workload on a one-time basis to update some voter re- electronic voter registration systems that the state operates, as well as voter registration cards to reflect that state parolees would be eligible to register to vote. Th- this one-time workload would re- result in one-time state costs that would also likely be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have when we get to that point. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so this was put on the, the ballot by the state legislature also. Um, Kevin McCarty from Sacramento, a member of the assembly, uh, was the one who authored it in the first place. And it, it passed also by a mostly party line vote, Democrats in favor. Um, the endorsements are the Democratic Party, Green Party, Libertarian, and Peace and Freedom parties. And then opposition is the Republicans. In support, we have the ACLU, the League of Women Voters, um, some unions, including the teachers and nurses unions, Kamala Harris, um, some Democratic legislators, Alex Padilla, and several other organizations. And then against, we have the Farm Bureau Federation and a a state senator, Jim Nielsen, who's a Republican. And the money is is extremely lopsided. So we have um, the ACLU and the Nurses Association, some unions and so forth, uh, giving money on on the pro side, and we don't have expenditures on the other side. So, you know, relatively low expenditures on this one compared to the other ballot measures. All right, so we are to the Q&A part. Are there any particular conditions as there are in Florida? No, so the Florida one had a condition in it that um, debts would ha- and fees would need to be paid in order to be registered to vote. That's not a condition. In this. So it just changed the state constitution to say that they would be able to register to vote. Okay, so once they're on parole, that's it. Yeah. Um, any studies done on the impact of parolee voting rights on crime? Um, So there has been a study in Florida that looked at how voting rights impacted recidivism or the correlation between voting rights and recidivism. Um, The the research is pretty limited at this time. It looks like that is it for questions on this, unless anybody has a last minute one to put in the Q&A. All right, thank you so much for your help and we will move on to the next measure. All right, Proposition 18. We have Nick Schroeder from the LAO to describe this one. Hi, good evening. Um, So under Proposition 18, um, people who are 17 years old, but who will be 18 years old at the time of a general election would be eligible to register to vote and to vote um, in the, uh, any preceding special elections and in the primary election preceding the general election when they would become 18 years of age. Um, as you probably all know, currently you have to be 18 to vote. Um, and one of the changes uh, that where this has a bigger effect would be for pre-registration. We're currently 16 and 17 year olds um, can pre-register to vote. And then when we become 18, they automatically are registered to vote under this measure. Um, when they become 17, they would then become automatically eligible to vote if they would be 18 at the time of the general election. Um, Similar to the Proposition 17, the fiscal effects would be um, primarily to the counties where it would be between $100,000, hundreds of thousands of dollars to a million dollars statewide uh, for the counties to update the registration systems and to process the higher voter um, number of registered voters. Uh, and then at the state level, there'd be minor costs uh, in the like hundreds of low hundreds of thousands of dollars range to update statewide uh, voter registration systems. And can I give people, uh, if you have questions to put them in the Q&A and use the chat, if you have, you know, other sort of technical issues or something like that. So um, we will go through the details on this one. So the legislature put this one on the ballot. It's Kevin Mullen, an, a Democratic member who was responsible Um, Again, mostly a party line vote with Democrats in favor. The Democratic Party, so, um, you know, all of the parties except for the Republicans are in support of it. 
And then we have a, a range of groups that are in support as well. So including the League of Women Voters, Conservation Voters, Secretary of State uh, Padilla, the governor, um, the Firefighters Association, nurses, so several unions as well. Against, just a few. And um, the media is um, somewhat split with the San Francisco Chronicle and the San Diego Union Tribune, LA Times on one side, and the Orange County Register and the Mercury News and some others uh, opposed to it. And then the expenditures are not very high on this one because it's not you know, impacting anybody's job. So we have um, you know, ballot committee, uh, the, the assembly member who started it all, and you know, some unions and so forth giving a little bit of money for this one, about half a million dollars in favor and nothing against. Okay, questions on Prop 18. Um, is there an estimate for how many people this would enfranchise? Come back. Uh, yeah, I'm coming back. <laughs> um, I'm looking in the ballot guide. I think we said, yeah, so as of June 29th, 2020, there were about 108,000 people who were 17 years old pre-registered to vote. And so those would be people that, if they would be 18 at the time of the general election, would be enfranchised at this time. Okay, great. How many other states have done something similar? Um, there's several states. I, for, I'm, I don't quite remember the exact number, but there are more than 10 um, states. And I'm getting, who, who initiated this? The, the legislature. And, okay, other questions on this measure? It's pretty straightforward, I think. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, so next we are moving on to Proposition 19. And we have Brian Euler presenting this one. Proposition 19 would make uh, several changes to the way that property taxes are applied to properties uh, that have just gone through a property transaction. Um, under California's current rules for taxing property, uh, most of the time when a property changes hands, its property tax bill increases. This means that the new owner uh, of a property typically ends up paying a higher property tax bill than the prior owner. And it also means uh, that if a current homeowner moves, uh, they end up paying a higher property tax bill for their new home uh, than their old home. Past voter measures have created two key exceptions to this rule. Uh, the first is for homeowners who are over 55 or severely disabled or whose property has been impacted by a natural disaster or contamination. Um, these homeowners can move uh, to a new home of equal or lesser value within the same county and keep their current property tax bill. Uh, they can also move to a limited number of other counties where local elected officials have voted to participate in this program. Uh, the second exception is for properties that are transferred between parents and children or grandparents and grandchildren uh, if the grandchild's parents are deceased. This exception applies without limitation to a parent or grandparent's primary home uh, as well as a limited amount of property use for other pur purposes such as rental property or businesses. Proposition 19 would make changes to both of the exceptions that I just uh, mentioned. First, Prop 19 would broaden in a few ways the uh, exception for homeowners who are over 55, severely disabled, or who have been impacted by a natural disaster. Uh, first, it would allow eligible homeowners to move to a home that is more expensive than their current home while maintaining a somewhat lower tax bill. Second, it would allow moves to any county in the state instead of the limited number of ones that uh, have voted to participate under current law. And finally, it would increase the number of times a homeowner can make use of this exception from uh, once in a lifetime to three times. Conversely, Prop 19 would narrow the exception for inherited properties. Specifically, it limits the exception to include only inherited properties that will be used by the child as a primary residence or a farm. Uh, the measure also places a limit on the amount of tax savings that can be received for higher value inherited properties. The two main components of Prop 19 would have offsetting effects on property tax collections for local governments. Uh, narrowing the inheritance rules would increase property tax revenues, while broadening the exception for eligible homeowners uh, would decrease property tax revenues but overall, uh, we think property, tax, property taxes would increase. Uh, in the first few years after the measure, we think cities, counties, and special districts could gain tens of millions of dollars per year. Uh, and over time, we think these revenue gains could grow to a few hundred million dollars uh, per year. 
We also think schools uh, could receive similar property tax gains to those of cities, counties, and special districts. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Okay, so this one was put on um, the ballot by the state, or the state legislature, um, passed it in June. Uh, the Democratic Party is in favor and the Libertarian Peace and Freedom parties are opposed. The Republican Party did not take a position on this one. We have endorsements by um, business organizations, labor organizations, the governor, um, the state treasurer and controller. And then the opposition is the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, the League of Women Voters, um, the Friends Committee on Legislation, among others. And then the newspaper that's pretty lopsided, just uh, the San Diego Union Tribune in favor and many others against. And the expenditures, we have realtors uh, on the yes side. So they, they must feel like they will um, sell more properties. Uh, the Democratic Party put some money in and some individuals. And then on the other side, we have the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And then again, this is super lopsided with uh, the money on the in favor of its side. All right, so the questions on Prop 19. How do you define severely disabled? Uh, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have the precise definition in front of me. It's, uh, there is one defined, there's an existing definition in statute that was actually created by prior voter measures. I don't have the specific definition in front of me. Does some of this money go to firefighters or firefighting? Uh, there, there is a, a provision that could potentially provide additional funding to firefighters. Um, I guess kind of the short of it is that there's a bit of a complicated interaction between this measure and California's school financing laws. Uh, that interaction means uh, that I mentioned earlier that we think this measure could result in additional property taxes going to schools. Maybe that's a few hundred million dollars a year down the line. Um, the interaction with school finance laws means uh, we think in, uh, in most years, those property taxes mean uh, just additional funding to schools. Uh, but there is a possibility that in some years, those rules will dictate that that money, in effect, will instead result in funding being placed in a statewide fund that would go to, to provide funding to CAL FIRE as well as the local fire districts. Can you explain why the tax, um, the income from taxes to the state would go up with this measure? Because part of it sounds like it would be the other direction. Yeah, so... Um, there's a potential, um, if you, one of, the, one of the things that's taxed as income are capital gains that you earn on the sale of a, a property. Um, and there is the potential because this measure would, uh, in effect, it would reduce um, some disincentives for, for certain people to uh, sell properties, um, that there could be an increase in property transactions. Some of those transactions might uh, result in uh, people taking uh, gains that could be taxed uh, as, as income. For the, uh. Okay. And is there any um, specific information about how long the home would need to be used as a primary residence by the child who inherited it? No. So those sorts of specifics aren't detailed in the measure. I think um, the kind of controlling rule is that the the there has to be a what's called a homeowner's exemption being claimed on the property which is only supposed to be claimed if uh the owner of the property is living there um there isn't anything in the language of the measure that specifies anything any details beyond that about how that would be implemented or checked um those sorts of details with a lot of measures are usually left up to uh, statutes passed by the legislature after the fact or various rulemaking bodies uh, like the Board of Equalization or County Assessors. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next, next measure. Thank you. All right, so we have Proposition 20 and we have Caitlin O'Neill presenting. Good evening. I'm going to describe the three main components of Proposition 20. 
But first, I want to provide some very brief background, which is that in California, the most severe type of crime is called a felony. And felonies can be punished um, by incarceration in either in prison or jail, um, depending on the specific circumstances. And state law classifies certain felonies as violent felonies. Misdemeanors are what we call the next most severe category of crime. And misdemeanors can be punished by no more than one year in jail. For example, stealing or shoplifting less than $950 of property or money is generally a misdemeanor in California. So the first type, uh, the first component of the measure is that would it, it would allow in three types of situations felony punishment for those who steal or shoplift property or money worth less than $950. And those situations are one, if the individual has prior convictions for certain theft related uh, crimes and steals more than $250 worth of property or money. Two, collaborates with other people to steal property on multiple occasions where the total value exceeds $250 within 180 days. Or three, there are certain specific circumstances present when up to $950 worth of property is stolen or shoplifted. Um, for example, under, the, under Proposition 20, people who shoplift property worth less than $950 that is not for sale, such as a cash register, could receive felonies instead of misdemeanors. The second component of the measure is that it would make various changes to an existing process for considering the release of inmates convicted of nonviolent crimes from state prison prior to completing their full sentences. For example, um, it would exclude certain inmate, inv inmates convicted of certain uh, crimes, such as sometimes of the types of assault and domestic violence. It would also require inmates who are den denied release under the process to wait two years rather than one year before being reconsidered for release. The third component of the measure is that it would require state and local law enforcement to collect DNA samples from adults convicted of certain types of misdemeanors, including shoplifting, forging checks, and certain domestic violence offenses. And this would be an expansion relative to current law under which adults are only required to provide DNA if they're either arrested for, charged with, or convicted of a felony, or required to register as sex offenders or arsonists. And on the whole, there's um, various sources of uncertainty regarding the fiscal effects of this measure, of course, um, largely related to uncertainty around how individuals uh, such as judges or prosecutors will respond to the changes. Um, but we do es we estimate, um, you know, keeping that uncertainty in mind, increases in state and local correctional court and law enforcement costs likely in the tens of millions of dollars annually, um, again, depending on implementation. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so this was put on by um, a woman who's a former district attorney and prosecutor and president of the Crimes, Crime Victims United. Um, the Republican Party is in support of this and the Democratic Party and the other minor parties are also in opposition. Uh, the San Diego Union Tribune is in support and then most of the other newspapers across the state are opposed. We have the Chamber of Commerce and Representative Devin Nunez, Albertsons and Safeway uh, in support. In opposition, we have the ACLU um, California Church Impact, which is a progressive uh, re religious group, the League of Women Voters, and former Governor Brown. And then the expenditures, we have Devin Nunez's campaign committee um, giving the most amount on that side. And on the opposition side, we have the Zuckerbergs, um, some other individuals, and um, the ACLU and Governor Brown's committee actually also puts a little bit of money into that one. And so we have more money being spent in opposition. And what questions do we have on Prop 20? Does this mean that the number of people kept in prison will increase? So there's two ways that the measure affects the prison population. The first is by making certain lower level 
theft crimes eligible for felony punishment. Currently, they, they're only eligible for misdemeanor punishment, except in certain circumstances. So by, by increasing the number of felony um, punishments for those crimes, certain people who have the criminal history that would um, allow them to go to prison under current uh, sentencing laws would go to prison, whereas otherwise, if they were under current law only convicted of a misdemeanor, they would not be eligible for prison. Um, the second way that the measure affects the prison population is by um, changing the process that was created under by Proposition 57 and 20 uh, that was passed in 2016, which I mentioned um, is uh, consider is for considering the release of inmates convicted of nonviolent crimes from prison, and so the the measure would um, would change would would reduce eligibility um, for that process as well as change aspects of the process itself that would generally um, sort of work towards reducing the number of people who would get out but prior to completing their full term. So um, we do estimate an increase in the prison population for those reasons. Okay, so so we don't have like a numerical. Uh, estimate exactly. You've estimated that it could affect several thousand people annually, kind of from all of those sentencing changes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Looks like you explained it so well that we just had the one question. So thank you so much. And we're moving on to Proposition 21. We have Lourdes Morales uh, presenting this one. Thank you for sticking around. Absolutely. So uh, to understand Proposition uh, 21, just sort of a bit of background, uh, some California cities today, such as Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Jose, have policies that limit how much landlords can increase rents from year to year. And these policies are generally known as rent control. About one fifth of California residents live in cities that have some sort of rent control policy in place. Current state law, uh, known as Costa Hawkins, sets some limits on the local um, rent control policies that can be put in place. And really there are sort of three main limitations under this current state law. Uh, the first is that rent control cannot apply to single family homes. The second is that rent control can't apply to homes that were built and completed uh, after February 1st, 1995. And uh, third, rent control can't tell landlords what they charge a new renter when they first move into a property. What Proposition 21 would do is modify these limitations of the current Costa Hawkins laws in such a way that cities and counties could apply rent control to more properties than under current law. And so the way these, mod these limitations are modified by 21 is that cities and counties could apply rent control to most property that's over 15 years of age. Uh, they could include single family homes so long as those homes are owned by individuals that have three or more properties. And cities and counties could uh, dictate what landlords charge a new renter when they first move in, so long as landlords are able to recover, or in excuse me, increase rents by 15% over uh, the first three years. Uh, so this measure would have a number of effects on state and local revenues, specifically property tax, sales tax, and income tax revenue. The way in which these revenue sources would be affected would really depend on the decisions that local governments take to use this uh, new flexibility in their local rent control uh, policy. So for example, whether cities choose to make no changes at all, cities that don't have rent control could expand their rent control. Um, and so there's a lot of uncertainty here, but overall we do think that there is a potential reduction in state and local revenue in the high tens of millions of dollars uh, over time. Um, mostly driven by a reduction in property tax revenues for local governments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this was put on the, the ballot by um, Michael Weinstein um, from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Support is from um, the Democratic Party, Green Party, Peace and Freedom are all in support and the Republicans and Libertarians against. In support, we had the ACLU, um, Courage California, Housing California, some unions, including the teachers and nurses, and Bernie Sanders. In opposition, we have the California Bu Business Roundtable, 
the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the NAACP, we talked about that earlier, um, the Taxpayers Association, Howard Jarvis as well, and also Governor Newsom. He feels like the law that was already passed is good enough. That was his argument. So in support, we have the LA Times, and then we have most of the rest of the newspapers across the state in opposition to this one. So the AIDS Healthcare Foundation gave a huge amount, $28 million. And then we have just smaller amounts from individuals and the nurses and the Democratic Party. And then on the no side, we have, um, you know, property management, real estate sorts of groups. And there's a lot, of, a lot more money on, in the opposition because those real estate groups have more money than those other ones do, of course. All right, questions on this one. Um, so a lot of the advertising has, talks about um, building new housing. Is there anything in the measure that, that speaks to that? So the measure uh, doesn't have any direct effect on whether housing is built or not. Um, it's really just about having this flexibility for local governments to institute their own rent control policies under those parameters that would be expanded. Um, there are a number of, sort of economic effects related to the measure, and so one would be an interaction with decisions that developers, for example, would make on whether it makes sense for them to build new housing under uh, the provisions of the measure were to go to effect. So it certainly could be, but it would really depend on um, the policies that local governments uh, put into place and how stringent they might or might be or might not be. So if there was new housing for the first 15 years, this would not apply. Is that right? That's correct. So under current law, you can't have it on housing that's built after 1995. This would sort of push that date up to 1995. I'm sorry, to 15 years from 1995. So generally, uh, 2015. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Another question, so the proposition gives the rights to the cities and counties to make the changes and um, are they automatic and the local government decides to enact them? Yeah, so nothing would be uh, dictated by Prop 21 specifically. Local um, jurisdictions, so cities and counties, would have to make their own decisions. So either by uh, actions of city councils or by ballot measures that would, that would be brought on locally to change their existing policies or put new policies in place if they don't have rent control today. All right, wonderful, thank you. We'll move on to the next measure. All right, so Proposition 22, we have Chaz Alamo presenting. Hello, um, Proposition 22 has to do with the worker classification of drivers uh, and delivery drivers uh, that work for app-based rideshare and delivery companies. Um, so as a bit of background, um, historically rideshare and delivery companies have hired their drivers as independent contractors. And independent contractors are different than employees insofar as they choose when and where to work and how much to work, but they also pay their own expenses and in this instance use their own vehicles to, to do the work. Um, in 2019, the state passed a law that limits what type of work companies can hire independent contractors to perform. And the state attorney general says that this new law means that rideshare and delivery company drivers must be made uh, employees rather than independent contractors. Um, the rideshare and delivery companies do not agree with this assessment. They continue to hire drivers as independent contractors. And these questions are uh, uh, being discussed currently in the courts as well as in this initiative. Um, as employees, uh, though drivers would have less flexibility about when and where to work and how much to work, the rideshare and delivery companies would be required under state law to provide them standard benefits and protections such as the minimum wage um, requirements that would cover uh, work, uh, workplace injuries with workers' compensation and so forth. Proposition 22 specifically would make drivers independent contractors and not employees. Um, the, the proposition would also provide drivers certain benefits, including uh, an earnings minimum, uh, a health insurance stipend for drivers who drive more than 15 hours a week for one company, as well as some other benefits. Um, regarding the fiscal effects, we believe that uh, the measure would result in lower costs and higher profits 
for the rideshare and delivery companies uh, because these companies would not have to provide the standard benefits and protections uh, state law requires for employees and therefore they would not have to pay these additional costs. As a result, um, rideshare and delivery fees and charges should be lower under the measure um, and that could increase the company's profits over the long term. Regarding uh, the effect on state uh, revenues, um, we believe that the drivers themselves, as well as stockholders in these companies, would pay higher income taxes. Um, and this is because there would be more drivers uh, as a group, because uh, with lower prices and, and fares, we believe that, that more consumers, or that consumers will, will take more rides and order more deliveries. Um, and also because the companies would potentially be more profitable in the future, investors would pay income taxes on these earnings. Um, to summarize, uh, we believe that the Proposition 22 would result in a minor increase in state income tax revenue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so this was put on the ballot, unsurprisingly probably, by Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash for economic reasons, as you might imagine. So in support, we have the Republican and Libertarian parties and opposition, the Democratic Party, Green and Peace and Freedom parties as well. In support, we have the Bay Area Council, Chamber of Commerce, Farm Bureau, police chiefs, small business association, taxpayers, including Howard Jarvis, and of course, um, all of those companies that um, put it on the ballot and that would be impacted, DoorDash, Instacart, Lyft, Postmates, and Uber. And then in opposition, we have conservation voters, Courage California Housing, California, the Sierra Club, um, a lot of unions, and also Joe Biden and Robert Reich, who was the, a, a secretary of, what was he secretary of? Anyhow, he was in the administration for um, Clinton. And then we have, um, in support, we have uh, most of the newspapers that, that weighed in on this one. And then in opposition, we have the LA Times. And then the funding, of course, the, the companies that would be directly impacted are putting a ton of money into this. So $51 million by Uber, so that clearly they think this makes a big difference to their bottom line. Lyft, DoorDash, also almost $50, 50 million dollars. And then Instacart and Postmates giving less, but still a good chunk of change. And um, on opposition, we have unions for the most part. So a whole lot of different unions pitching in some money. But the, those companies have a lot more um, money to spend and it, it impacts their bottom line in a very serious way. And the unions obviously don't, but we're still looking at huge amounts, like 188 million almost on the one side and almost 15 million on the other. So these are huge numbers. All right, let's see what questions we have on this one. Is it possible to pass Prop 22, but also adjust the embedded 7 eighths majority requirement to alter it even after the election? That seems steep and unreasonable for making adjustments. Would, they, would an adjustment have to be carried out in the uh, judicial system? What do you think? Our understanding is that um, an adjustment of the, of the type mentioned in the, in the question would not be possible without meeting that seven eighths requirement in the initiative. Okay, so it requires a seven eighths. Are there laws? So this proposition will keep drivers as independent contractors? That's correct, yes. Secretary of Labor, thank you. Um, any research done on the percentage of drivers who favor this proposition? I, I believe um, the companies themselves have asked their drivers and maybe some independent researchers as well, but I'm not uh, familiar enough with the results to, to share them here, but they may be available elsewhere. Uh, how would this measure affect the pocketbooks and benefits of existing full-time Uber and DoorDash drivers? Well, I think it's worth taking that question maybe in two parts. Uh, first, with, with pocketbooks. Um, we didn't find evidence in reviewing the effect of this initiative, as well as the effect of, of making drivers employees. that suggested 
across the board, income for drivers would go up or would go down. What we think is more likely is that certain drivers would see increased income under an employee model, uh, whereas other drivers might, might receive less income. Now, regarding benefits themselves, uh, because the, the independent contractor status is not associated with any required benefits from uh, the rideshare and delivery companies, uh, there, there are a few benefits now, and, and there would be an expectation that the benefits in the initiative would be uh, the only uh, new benefits going forward. As I mentioned, there's a minimum pay standard, as well as a health insurance stipend and, and some other requirements. Um, benefits associated with an employment model are those that are provided under state law, uh, minimum wage, workers' compensation, um, discrimination and harassment laws, and, and so on and so forth. Would this make rideshare companies responsible for any misconduct that their employees engage in? I think that question it is likely to be a, a legal question and, and one I don't want to try to answer will be determined uh, should the, the measure pass in the future. Okay. Do other states have similar laws? No, um, not to my knowledge, at least on a statewide basis. Some local municipalities have um, set certain requirements on rideshare and delivery companies. Uh, New York City is one in particular that has a, an earnings minimum. But to my knowledge, no large municipality has um, intended for drivers to be treated as employees by the companies. Would this, um, oh, let's see, what's the chance that Uber and Lyft might cease operations in California if this happens? It's unknown. Um, what I can say is that uh, the, the rideshare and delivery companies' business models are built on the model of, of you having drivers be uh, work as independent contractors and the flexibility that that offers to them. And so having drivers work instead as employees does represent a, a fundamental shift in the, the business model. How they respond and as well how consumers respond to those changes, uh, we'll, we'll, we don't know and we would have to wait and see. Would this um, impact freelancers in other industries like journalists? It would not, no. Um, the Proposition 22 is specific to drivers that work for uh, rideshare companies as well as food delivery service and other delivery, uh, app-based delivery companies uh, and not other um, forms of independent contractor work uh, that may fall under, under the prior state law. Do other countries have similar laws? I'm not familiar enough with the international context to draw comparisons. Um, the, the companies, the app-based companies, are involved in uh, sort of ongoing um, determinations about the worker status of their drivers in other countries, uh, specifically in, in some European countries. And what, are, what could you repeat again what the increased worker benefits would be? Um, sure, I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail here. Um, Proposition 22 would provide an earnings minimum, uh, and that would require the companies to pay 120% of the local minimum wage for each hour a driver spends driving. Um, but that would not take into account time that the driver spends waiting for a, a call to come in. Um, there is a health insurance stipend beginning for, for workers who, are, who work more than 15 hours a week for one uh, of the rideshare companies. Um, there would be a, a requirement that the companies cover some of the costs associated with injury if a driver gets hurt while working. Um, there's also a, a rest policy in, the, in Proposition 22 and several other requirements related to um, having a, a sexual harassment policy, um, conducting criminal background checks, and mandating safety training for drivers. Do we know if Uber and Lyft drivers are for or against in, in the main? As I mentioned earlier, I'm not familiar enough with the, the various surveys of the drivers themselves on Proposition 22. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. That was a lot of questions. We appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, we're moving on to the next measure. Prop 23, and we have Sonia Pettit. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Nalder. Um, yes, I'm Sonia Pedic, and I'll be discussing Proposition 23, which concerns dialysis clinics. And by way of a very brief background, California currently has about 600 licensed dialysis clinics in the state, each of which is overseen by a medical director who must be a board certified physician and whose responsibilities um, typically take about a quarter of a full-time position. Um, Together, these 600 roughly 600 clinics um, see approximately 80,000 patients per month. Dialysis, um, people who have kidney failure either require dialysis or uh, a kidney transplant. So what happens is a patient's own doctor will refer them to a dialysis, to a dialysis clinic for treatment and the patient will receive dialysis treatments about three times a week and each treatment lasts about four hours. Because of this um, robust um, treatment schedule, many of the clinics are often open six days a week and are often open beyond a typical eight hour business day. Um, the way that dialysis is paid for is through a patient's private health insurance or if they um, receive public um, health insurance, which is Medi-Cal in California, the state's Medicaid program, or they receive um, federal Medicare. Now dialysis, having, I'm sorry, having kidney failure is a condition that qualifies most patients for Medicare, Medicare in the long run. Um, before Medicare payments kick in, either Medi-Cal or the patient's private insurance would serve as the primary payer. Dialysis clinics are also currently required to report infection-related data to the federal government. So Proposition 23 would make a few changes. One is that it would require a licensed doctor to be on site at the clinic during all treatment hours. If the clinic's in an area with a doctor shortage, they could apply for an exception to have either a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant um, fulfill that role. Proposition 23 also requires that clinics report infection data not only to the federal government, but also to the state. And it requires um, clinics to obtain the consent of the California Department of Public Health prior to closing or substantially reducing services. Now, um, because this measure would require clinics to have a doctor on site during all treatment hours, we estimate that this would increase costs for a clinic by several hundred thousand dollars annually. Um, in response to these higher costs, we expect that clinics would try to negotiate either, there would be one of several responses. They would either try to negotiate higher rates with health insurance plans, um, including uh, Medi-Cal or Medicare, uh, as well as private plans. Um, they may continue current operations, but at uh, receiving lower profits, or they may decide to close some clinics. Um, we estimate that bec uh, because of the, um, because of clinics potentially negotiating higher payment rates from Medi-Cal and from the health insurance plans that cover state and local public employees, that the cost to state and local governments could be in the low tens of millions of dollars annually. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so this was put on essentially by um, union members that would want to, their unions would, would um, want to unionize the clinics. So the Democratic Party, the Green Party and Peace and Freedom Party are all in support and the Republican and Libertarian parties are in opposition. We have only opposition from newspapers and most newspapers across the state do oppose it. In support, we have Courage California, the Labor Federation, firefighters, a couple of unions there. In opposition, we have the Chamber of Commerce, the California Medical Association, uh, the NAACP State Conference, and the Friends Committee on Legislation. And then the money here is really intense as well. So um, essentially, we have the, the dialysis companies pouring you know, 60 million for DaVita and the other one, 26 million. Um, so it's all dialysis related companies. 
And so it's those dialysis companies uh, are totaling uh, over a hundred million dollars against it. So clearly they think it would impact their bottom line having to have a doctor on staff all the time. All right, questions on this one. I had a question. We, um, we did some ad watches with KCRA earlier on this and some of the ads depict dirty conditions at the dialysis clinics. Is there any evidence of that? That's um, a good question. Um, you know, the clinics do need to report um, infection related information to the federal government already. So while I can't comment on the current conditions at um, the clinics, there is sort of that, that federal oversight um, uh, uh, currently built in. Um, and the, this measure, as you know, would require those, um, that data to also be reported to the California Department of Public Health. So currently it's already reported to the feds so that the, the reporting requirements are not, you know, brand new. It's different re reporting to, they're reporting to the state as well. Yes, right? um, it's conceivable that the Department of Public Health could um, have slightly different reporting requirements or request additional information from the clinics, or it could just ask the clinics to share what they um, report to the federal government, to the State Department of Public Health. The measure um, stipulates that the department would be in charge of deciding what should be reported and in what form. It does also require the department to post that information publicly on their website. Great. Um, is there any data available summarizing the negative impact on the status quo of not having doctors uh, available? Um, that's a question that's really outside the scope of our current, you know, analysis on this particular initiative. Okay. Um, do we know the position of the Cal California Department of Public Health? I am not aware of them uh, taking a position. Um, I can't say for sure one way or the other. I do know that the department would um, they would have increased administrative costs just in terms of um, writing the regulations and making sure clinics report the infection information, assessing penalties if they don't report the information. However, a lot of those additional costs to the, or all of those additional costs to the department would be covered by license fees assessed on the clinics. Okay. And I guess this is sort of an ask, but, um, is there a rationale for um, why we need a doctor at every clinic as opposed to just the medical director who would have been overseeing it, you know, in, in a general way? Again, that's a question that's really sort of outside the scope of our analysis. Gotcha. All right. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. We, we will move on to the next measure. So Proposition 24 with Anita Lee presenting. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> um, Proposition 24 relates to the privacy of data collected from consumers. So a little bit of background on this one. Um, businesses do collect information about consumers from different places. There are public sources, from you consumers yourselves, as well as from other businesses. And they use it for a variety of purposes, including providing whatever service you're interested in, um, to targeting ads, to also making predictions about consumers. Um, under state law, certain businesses that operate in California and collect personal data, such as names, um, internet activity, or predictions about individuals, et cetera, are required to meet certain consumer data privacy requirements. At a high level, the businesses are generally those that earn more than 25 million in annual revenue, that buy, sell, or share the personal data of 50,000 or more consumers, households, or devices annually, or earn 50% or more of their annual revenues from selling that personal data. Um, key um, requirements that they are required to comply with is that they're required to notify consumers uh, if they collect or sell data. They have to allow consumers to request information about the data that's collected about them and to allow consumers to delete that data or tell businesses to delete that data. 
as well as to direct businesses to not sell it. In addition to that, they are not allowed to treat consumers who make use of any of these rights differently. There are financial penalties that can be levied if businesses do not comply, and they're generally enforced by the California Department of Justice or DOJ. So what this proposal would do is that it would really expand consumer privacy rights. Um, consumers would have certain new rights. So for example, consumers could direct businesses to not share their personal data, um, to correct data, um, that is in their possession, and to limit a subset of data, which is now categorized as sensitive personal data. This includes things like your social security number, account logins, passwords, etc., so that they can only be used for providing the service that an, in, a person was interested in or to fulfill a business purpose. Um, it also, on the margins, makes changes to other rights, but it, one of the key things is it does change the number of businesses that would need to comply. It generally reduces the businesses that would have to comply. And kind of the final major change is that it does create a new state agency um, to complement the California Department of Justice. Um, this new agency would be responsible for developing regulations um, as well as enforcing um, the laws. To the extent that the Department of Justice was also enforcing the laws, California DOJ would have priority, and those would be cases that move through the court system. So in terms of the fiscal effects, um, we did identify that the increased state costs associated for the new state agency would be at least $10 million. The proposition actually specifically requires an appropriation of that amount. But depending on how they take on and kind of implement their duties, it could be um, potentially higher. There would also be increased cost to the California Department of Justice as well as courts for cases that are moving along on that side. So these are cases that DOJ chooses to tell the agency, you know, hold off, we're, you know, we're going to take on these cases. To the extent that there are penalty revenues that are won, um, those penalty revenues are supposed to help offset sort of those costs. So some or all of those portions of the increased costs would be offset. Happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, so we have, uh, this one was put on the ballot by a, an individual who's a real estate developer and consumer privacy advocate. Mm -hmm. It's supported by the Peace and Freedom Party and the Republican Libertarian Green parties are opposed. The Democratic Party did not take a position on this one. Uh, once again, we have the LA Times as the outlier there in support and most of the rest of the newspapers across the state that took a position are in opposition. Uh, in support, we have the firefighters, uh, a few Democratic legislators and Andrew Yang of the Yang Gang fame. And in opposition, we have the ACLU, um, business organizations, taxpayers organizations, the League of Women Voters, um, the Nurses Association and Dolores Huerta. It's quite the combo there. And then um, on the funding, we have, again, the individual who got it on the ballot in the first place, giving the most money, and then other individuals and a group called Californians for Consumer Privacy. And then in opposition, we have the Nurses Association. The League of Women Voters gave a whole $234. So big spenders on that one. Um, and the Consumer Federation of California. So super lopsided on this one, we have money in favor of it, but very little against. All right, I, I'm gonna go back up to that slide that I failed to show while we do questions. So is this essentially a pay for privacy for the consumer? Um, I think the term pay for privacy means different things to different individuals. So I'm going to answer it in a way, and if this doesn't address it, feel free to insert it. So you're not paying a fee for privacy, so it's not pay that way. Um, the way to think about it is the onus is, is on the consumer to initiate these rights. So it is the consumer that is requesting information from the business. It is the consumer that's requesting to correct information, et cetera. So there is a burden on the consumer rather than it being automatic. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, thank you on that one. We will move on to our final proposition, Proposition 25. 
So Proposition um, 25 is a referendum on bail. And so what a referendum means is that the legislature enacted a law and you are being asked whether or not that law should go into effect or not. This is always confusing, so I'm going to put it out there. So what I'm about to describe to you in terms of changes, if you want that to happen, you vote yes. If you do not want it to happen, you vote no. Um, so a little bit of background um, related to bail. There are really kind of two ways that you can obtain release from jail prior to trial. Um, one is to bail out, which is a financial guarantee. Um, another way is that there is release on your own recognizance. That's where the judge decides that you can be released under certain conditions. Um, for example, that you're promising to appear in court at future dates, et cetera. Um, when individuals are paying cash bail, there are kind of two points where that could happen. Um, when an individual is put in jail, they can pay bail based on this list that was put together by the county or you can be released on bail once you show up in court for your first hearing. This is the 48 hours from your arrest. And the court basically goes through the process of figuring out what they deem is appropriate. What this initiative would do is that it would eliminate the cash portion and it would sh shift to a new process where individuals would either be released automatically or um, based on their assessed risk of committing another crime or not appearing in court if they were released. And how this works is basically individuals who are convicted, or, or, sorry, arrested for most misdemeanors would generally be released from jail within 12 hours. Um, everybody else would generally have to undergo a risk assessment. And a key component of this um, proposition is that pretrial risk assessment tools tools that um, use underlying data to figure out what factors are more conducive to um, higher risks of committing another crime or not appearing in court if released would be used to provide information um, on risk levels. Um, depending on those risk levels, uh, certain individuals could be released prior to that first appearance in court, while all others would be held until that first court hearing. At that court, first court hearing, individuals would generally be released unless the district attorney made a strong case that there were no conditions under which um, an individual would not commit another crime or, um, or would appear in court at future dates if required. So in terms of, uh, and the final piece, I'm sorry, is that no one would be charged fees as a condition of release. There can be conditions for release on individuals who are considered medium risk to high risk, um, or if the judge deems that it's appropriate. These can include things like an electronic monitoring system, et cetera, but individuals could not be charged for that. So in terms of the fiscal, this means um, that for the costs related to this new pretrial release process, it would be potentially in the mid hundreds of millions of dollars. It would depend on how it was being implemented. So it could be um, more or less. Um, in terms of county jail costs, it would be a dec decrease possibly in the high tens of millions of dollars annually. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. All right, so the legislature passed this as a law in 2018. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we have the referendum process, which is essentially after the legislature passes something, it can be put on the ballot to be approved by the people. So it's called the people's veto sometimes. And so that was used in this case. Um, an election lawyer named Thomas Hilchak uh, is the one who is behind getting this put uh, up for referendum for the people. So the California Democratic Party is in support. They, they are the majority in the legislature that passed it in the first place, doing away with cash bail. Uh, and the Peace and Freedom Party is on that side as well. And then the opposition is the, the Republican Party and the Green Party. In support, we have um, the California Medical Association, the League of Women Voters, the Sierra Club, the Federation of Teachers, Teachers Organizations, Nurses Organizations, other unions, uh, Governor Newsom, and uh, many uh, Democratic state legislators, which makes sense because they passed it. Um, and then in opposition, we have the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association, 
business organizations, essentially, the Farm Bureau, and then, of course, the bail agents, right? Because essentially what this would do is do away with their business if we didn't have to pay money for bail. I shouldn't say we, people who are accused of crimes. Um, and then in support, uh, as far as newspapers, we have pretty much every newspaper in the state that took a position supporting, and we don't have any in opposition. The money side, um, we have some union money on the, the pro side, some individuals, and then, you know, which doesn't add up to a ton. And then on the opposition, of course, we have bail companies, right? Um, company, insurance companies and bail bonds organizations that would be out of business essentially if we didn't have any cash bail anymore. And so we have about 12 million in favor and about 10 million against on this one. So big dollars, but not as big as some of those that we've seen already. All right, the questions on this one. What's the formula for assessing risk exactly? Yeah, um, so the, there are various tools that have been developed by nonprofit organizations and academic institutions. They are tools that basically use data to take a look at um, traits, certain traits like age, et cetera, of individuals, and what traits lead to individuals being more likely, at least, at least according to data, to committing another crime or failing to appear um, in court. And so depending on the inputs, you know, about an individual, it will output sort of a score that is then categorized as whether you are a low risk, medium risk, or high risk. Um, sometimes they're more specific in terms of their, for example, medium risk for a certain type of crime, or it's like a medium risk for um, committing another crime or specifically failing to appear. So they're different. There are a variety of tools that are available. So one, one question a lot of people are bringing up is, um, does that algorithm have racial bias cooked in? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Um, at, when SB 10 was amended kind of at the very end, this is actually where a lot of criminal justice um, reform organizations actually split. Um, there are a number of entities who ultimately opposed SB 10 for this particular reason in terms of these tools are based on data that has been collected over time. And so to the extent that the criminal justice system is biased towards um, individuals, minorities, essentially, or other biases, that will be reflected in the tool because your tool is only as good as the underlying data. Um, that being said, just to kind of provide a fair and balanced approach. The other perspective is that individuals are concerned that under the current system, judges are sort of making those decisions. And judges equally, you know, depending on um, how they approach it, you could argue also have implicit bias. And so I think that's one of the, the key issues of debate. Has this, uh, was the 2018 uh, revocation of cash bail in effect the last two years or did the referendum stop it? No. So when a referendum um, qualifies for the ballot, it goes on halt. And so this would have gone into effect um, October 1st of 2019, but it did not. Um, if this goes into effect, the legislature has recently passed another bill that would mean it goes into effect October 1st of 2021. And the only reason for that is to give, there was buffer room to allow for implementation allow for courts and probation departments, et cetera, to get up to speed. And because this referendum qualified, they didn't have the opportunity to do that. And so the legislature basically said, we're gonna make sure you have that time. Um, does this evaluation tool take into consideration a person's living situation or psychological state? Um, so I, I, there are a lot of tools. So I will say that I am not um, an expert in terms of every component. It, in terms of living situation, there is frequently a question um, related to family situation. Um, it looks sometimes at family ties and community ties. Um, the psycho emotional state, I would say um, that one, it, it could be a factor when there is someone that is using the tool. Um, and using the tools to help them make a decision. And so like if someone was saying, you know, we have got some concerns related to mental health, et cetera, um, that would be factored in. 
Um, in terms of other psycho-emotional, because I've seen psycho-emotional also kind of be reflected in terms of, you know, are there other conditions? It depends on the tool. You know, sometimes they'll ask questions about, you know, prior history, et cetera. Okay. And remind us again, does support mean we're supporting the law that was passed already? Um, so you vote yes if you want the changes to go into effect. You vote no if you don't. So yes means cash bail goes away. Cash bail goes away and this new, tool, the, this new process goes into effect, yes. Okay, great. Is there one statewide algorithm or tool? Um, no, not, at, not under SB 10. SB 10 requires the, ju um, the judicial branch to basically come up with a list of evidence-based tools um, but each county would generally have the flexibility to select which tool they wanted to use or combination of tools. I don't think they're held to actually one. They could use multiple, like multiple ones if they wanted to. Okay. Wonderful. I think we've got the questions answered. Thank you so much for your help. No problem. Thank you so much. All right, so a few little things to wrap up. We have some resources here on this reference list. Um, IGS at Berkeley, the Inst Institute for Governmental Studies, has a nice um, rundown of a lot of tools, nonpartisan organizations. Uh, these videos will actually be linked from their site eventually. California Choices is related to that. Ballotpedia is very helpful. Voters Edge, all of those are useful uh, organizations to get additional information. Uh, we wanted to thank the Retirees Association of Sacramento State for helping support this effort, and also the College of Social Sciences and Interdisciplinary Studies, and the Department of Political Science. And we also wanted to let you know before you go that the videos from this event will be available hopefully tomorrow afternoon on the website for the Project for an Informed Electorate. So the URL is csus.edu slash ssis slash pi. And they will be subtitled in English. And then a day or two later, we'll also put up subtitles in Spanish. So if you have people that you would like to share these with, especially those who would like the Spanish subtitles that haven't been reached before when we've done this event, please do share that information with them. Uh, also, we will have the initiatives. Well, you could watch the entire event, but we'll also have videos per initiative. So you could just go back to ones that maybe you wanted to review again or that you wanted to share with people. So once again, thank you to so many people for sticking around for this event and showing up for the virtual version of it. And hopefully we see you again in two years. So thanks to everyone who participated. Thank you to the Legislative Analyst Office, very generously volunteering their time to do this. The Public Library for being our partner in this all these years. And um, people from the um, Sacramento State um, president's office who really helped put this together behind the scenes as well. So thank you so much to everyone and good night. <laughs>